Alan midway through the NBAA 2011 extravaganza, where uh, where the attitude is finally turning to, okay, we're mad, we're not going to take it anymore. Uh, one of the things that we're having some fun with is the fact that there are companies still willing to make the bet, still willing to invest, and still believe that there's a future for business in aviation. Okay, where are we at with Kestrel? Well, before I answer the where we are at with Kestrel, let me say that here midway through NBAA, I think in general the the attitude of the show is uh, more upbeat. I think there's more people here. I think that definitely we've kind of bottomed out and the industry is coming back. Having said that, obviously we have a long ways to go. As an industry, we have to do a much, much, much better job of educating the public about what benefits this industry brings to people, the economy, society in general. And what I often tell people is that I'm an airplane nut and I love airplanes, but we shouldn't be trying to convince everybody that they need to love airplanes. We just need to convince everybody that they benefit from the fact that there is an aircraft industry and that business aviation puts people to work. In terms of Kestrel, obviously we think we'll take advantage of that in the future, that this will be a very efficient airplane, one that puts people to work, one that's effective transportation, efficient transportation, and we'll sell them a lot of airplanes. The road to get there? always challenging. The fun part is the airplane and the engineering, so that's all going pretty well. And the financing in this world is always frustrating, but we feel pretty good about that as well. The process since the announcement obviously has been one where you're not only building an organization, but building a uh, profile by which you will uh, head to certification and to production. What is the process look like from here? Uh, obviously you've got Two different areas you're working out of, both the uh, eventual manufacturing location in Maine and, of course, and your design group in Duluth. But where does it go from here? What does it look like? Yeah. Well, part of the reason we chose this project, the Kestrel, which was originally Farnborough Aircraft, is because so much work had been done. And so we now have an engineering group in Duluth, an engineering group in Maine, working to modify the design and do the certification work and the production work. Still reasonably early in that We've got a fuselage design that we like. We're narrowing down on the wing. We've selected the Honeywell engine. So those things are all coming along pretty well. But there's obviously a lot of work to do still from an engineering and certification point of view. From a production point of view, we've got the facility in Maine. Uh, we hope we'll still be building the airplane there, but there's other possibilities as we kind of work through the economic development process. Think of it as sort of three years of hard work but fun work. Um, the, the happiest I am is when we can be talking to engineers about the design as opposed to the, the other parts of the project, but it's coming along really well. What are the milestones that we can look forward to between now and first certification? The biggest milestone that people will recognize from the outside will be the flying of the next airplane. We want to be a little careful about calling it or not calling it a conforming prototype, but we do expect it to be as a flight test vehicle which is sufficiently conforming that we will be using that data for certification. But we won't have everything done on it. That airplane is 12 months away. We would hope that we would have it sort of NBAA next year, but it could end up being end of the year, or beginning of the year after that. In between, there will be selection of vendors. There will be increasing the engineering team, selection of more of the physical sites, whether it's Brunswick or elsewhere, for putting people to work. And I think all of those things are, are important milestones as well. Obviously, the question that we get often is, tell me about financial milestones. And you know, we tend not to turn those into announcements, but they'll happen along the way as well. Abadine is the brand of choice for pilots who want innovative, easy to use avionics. And the new IFD 540 GPS Navcom sets a new standard for simplicity in communication and LPV navigation. As a slide-in replacement for existing 530 series navigators, and with a highly intuitive touchscreen control, the IFD 540 makes it much easier to access the information you want when you want it, reducing head down time and making flying more enjoyable. Finally, you have a choice, and the choice is easy. Avidine. One of the things that really set your work at Sirius apart was your adoption of truly innovative technologies, the parachute glass panel, and so many other things. And even on not so much an innovative level as an evolutionary level, the selection of Tornado Alley and one of the best uh, uh, turbo installations I've ever flown and things of that nature where there was this constant emphasis on things that just plain worked. With a project like Kestrel 
there's not as much, there's outwardly it appears not as much chance to innovate. Or is there? Well, you would be correct that outwardly it wouldn't have that appearance. <laughs> Obviously, the innovations that matter most are the ones that change the way the customer uses the product. You mentioned glass cockpits, parachutes, and the Tornado Alley turbocharging system as three, where you can look at an airplane before those technologies and said, what does the pilot have to do? What does the passenger perceive? What are the benefits of that airplane? There are others as well, less visible, that have to do with comfort and visibility and handling qualities. And we're looking at all those kinds of things. I think that you know, anybody who climbs through this mock-up here behind us and compares it to the existing Kestrel prototype begins to recognize some of those changes. There's a place to put your foot. You know, where you reach as you climb into the cockpit is easier. The visibility, how does it look outside? Yet to be shown, but in that next airplane will be handling qualities. What does the airplane feel like on a slow approach into a grass runway? You won't see rocket-assisted takeoffs for vertical performance, and you won't see, you know, the a holographic display of the future sitting in front of the cockpit. But it'll, it'll be innovative enough that it will be immediately recognizable to anybody who gets into and flies this airplane compared to what other airplanes have been. But of course that's what we should expect. We, as an industry, we should always be doing better. How much of Kestrel is going to be bet on the concept that these things are meant to be used by owner pilots? Well, al almost everything will be bet on that. Obviously, the kind of objective standards, how fast does it fly, how much weight does it carry, what kind of distance, we think we will be very, very competitive at. That's essential for the owner flown market. It's essential for growing the market. But I would argue it's also important for the professionally flown market. When we look at accidents and try and figure out what were the cause of the accidents, we all know that the typical accident is pilot error. Well, one way that you improve pilot error statistics are with better training. Another way is to take away whatever it was that caused the accident. You know, you, you don't have a knob to turn, you can't turn it wrong. <laughs> so, you know, we, we're very focused on simplifying the airplane. That's a, that is avionics, that's engine management, that is handling qualities, that's visibility. Again, I mentioned earlier, uh, how does the airplane feel on a slow approach into a grass runway? That doesn't come down to what do the numbers say the airplane will do. The numbers are determined you know, by a test pilot. What I care about is how comfortable is it for any pilot to fly that slow approach into a short runway. How is the team forming right now behind the Kestrel project? Yeah, I've been very fortunate to work with a lot of great people and very fortunate to have a lot of those same people working with us on Kestrel. So yeah, this is an experienced team that's done Cirrus airplanes and other airplanes as well. So that helps from a purely project point of view. But more importantly, in terms of the culture of the team, it's just fantastic. We have a very flat organization, a great working relationship. We argue, we throw ideas back and forth. Um, I give people my strong opinions and then let them convince me that it ought to be something else if they can <laughs> convince me, and, and, and they have on a number of occasions. <clears throat> so it, it's really been a, a, a great team. The learning experience to get to this point has a lot to do with organizational structure and those things as well. So, you know, we intend on keeping that a key focus of the company. We're going to keep this company operating a certain way and refuse to allow it to turn into other types of organizations. If all goes as planned with Kestrel, what's your next move? Where do you logically take both your experience and background in association with everything you've seen in this industry and what you think it needs? Where do you go from here? As I said at the beginning of this, I really have a huge faith in the value of general aviation and what it can do for everybody outside of the industry. And because of that, I think this is a growth industry. Stuck in our current situation, a lot of people don't see it that way, but I do. And in a growth industry, obviously, you will look for other ways of responding to that market. In our case, building airplanes, that means other designs. When we'll work on other designs and other ways of working with customers from an operations point of view, whether it's air taxis that become uh, more prevalent in the future or uh, individuals who need a certain kind of operational assistance so they don't have to worry about maintenance, insurance, those kinds of issues.
Welcome to the Aero News Network, the aviation world's most comprehensive news and information resource. Real-time 24-7 online audio and video programming, where aviation has been getting updated for over a decade. Distributing over 11,000 stories, features, audio and video programs every year. Only ANN covers aviation and aerospace with this much depth, insight and expertise. Check us out on the web at aero-news.net. How's the AeroWorks project coming along? The main driving force behind AeroWorks is economic development requirement for revenue, but obviously given that as a starting point, we're really excited about bringing that same user-friendly sort of innovation to other airplanes. I've been flying a Meridian now for about five months, and I can tell you that the performance is compelling. The pressurization, the cruise speed, I think I'm better than book all the time uh, from a cruise speed point of view, has really been great. But there are things that we can improve that we think other customers will benefit from as well. And that's simplifying the avionics, simplifying the ingress, egress to the cockpit for those of us of larger stature. So lots of those things that we think can improve the airplane and in doing so allow other customers to step up to it. You know, again, I'm very impressed with the Meridian in a lot of ways, but I can recognize why some let's just say hypothetically Cirrus customers that are moving up to it would find it more challenging given the simplicity of operating a Cirrus. We want to try and bridge that gap as I know Piper is on new airplanes and we intend to on the used airplanes. I would assume also that AeroWorks becomes quite a laboratory for you for the future. There are things we will be trying in AeroWorks, yes. That is, uh, interesting. When you think about laboratory, obviously the first thing that comes to mind is the product. Uh, but we think of it slightly different. Part of it's the product, but the other part is the interface with the customer that becomes part of the AeroWorks process as well. And finally, let me put you on the spot. Uh, Bill Boyster started out uh, the press conference roulette uh, Sunday morning with a stinging um, indictment of what the government has done to this business over the last several years, and more important, the dishonesty that he sees in the approach it's taken to business aviation to the rest of the aviation world. We've heard this from a number of the CEOs and a number of the folks in the business, obviously having worn the CEO hat of several times. We figure you might have something to say on this. Got a message for the administration? Well, actually, I don't think it's a message for the administration. I think it's a message for society. Because while I would agree completely with Bill about the hypocrisy, to use a fairly strong word, of the government's portrayal of of business aviation, it's clearly not just them. It's the news media. It is the, the banking and finance industry. It is the hypocrisy of someone who buys a home at the end of the runway and then complains about the airplane. So society has contradictory views on what's best for society, that it knows is best for society, and the little steps along the way. You know, call it NIMBYs or whatever you want to. We have a huge problem in our society of you know, failures of logic, failures of integrity that we need to improve. Unfortunately, general aviation is, it makes a wonderful punching bag. And so, again, whether it's government, news media, uh, finance uh, organizations, we get thrown to the wolves improperly. So hopefully, the industry will do a better job of educating the rest of the people. It, it would be less tolerated by society if society understood the facts better. And if it was less well tolerated, it'd be less often used. <laughs>